All right, tonight we're going to talk about feature scripts in Onshape, which is one of the more powerful things we can do to speed up our CAD development a lot. Um, I don't always remember all of them, so a lot of times I end up doing some of the stuff manually too. But if you go through it, at least there's a few that are super useful for FRC that we can go over. Um, I posted in the meeting chat the link to our like Onshape resources guide that's in the drive. Um, it has a bunch of feature scripts links, so after it goes to like the getting started and MKCAD, which we'll do another one on to make sure everyone understands exactly how that works, but I think there's going to be some potential changes to MKCAD coming, so we'll do that a little bit later. Um, but the feature scripts, there's a ton of them. Um, we'll look at what all the ones that I have installed. I have way too many activated in my Onshape. Um, you probably don't need that many, I think. Well, I'm actually logged into Spectrum, but we can make sure we can go through how to add some of them too. But the first ones we'll go through are kind of the basic ones that are Julia's feature scripts. Um, they're written by a person named Julia who's in the FRC community, so they're all like very FRC specific, and they allow us to do some things very, very quickly, and we'll go through some of these and kind of how they work. Um, there's some other ones that do similar things, so like Alex is another um, person who writes them for FRC specific stuff. There's also ones that are just written for people who just use Onshape, who normally don't design robots, they're just useful CAD things. Um, which gets us into like Lighten and Laser Joint and T-Slot. Some of them we've used or used on and off in different projects you may have seen. But there's, they get even further, um, and we'll go through what some of these are, which ones make sense to use and how, um, and kind of where how we can install them and make sure you have them on your account when you're actually catting. Um, okay, so let's look at some of the basic ones first. So um, Julia's feature scripts... You click on this, like, the green link is the one that actually takes you to how you can actually install the feature script. So it's a document. It's just an on-shape document where they go in and actually write. Um, software, or they, they write code to allow us to automate some process inside of on-shape. Um, so it can let us do things very, very quickly. Um, the programming isn't incredibly complicated. Like some of it, some of the stuff they do is really, really cool. But if you want to do some basic things, like if you really wanted to, you could probably learn to write your own. I almost never, you never have to touch any of the actual software side. Um, I think I've done it like once for something. Uh, most of the time we're just using the stuff that other people write. But you can actually go in and when you see the feature scripts, you can see what each thing does. And you can go in and actually like read it and figure out what the software is if you really wanted to. Again, most of the time we're not, we ignore all of that. And we can sit there on like the README for it, um, see what happens, and it kind of tells you how to add them. So you go up to this custom features button, and it lists all of the feature scripts that she has added to this feature script document. So there's a few that she's added that we don't actually have yet, so we can go ahead and add them. So if you just click on the ones that aren't blue, they get added to your toolbar. So we can get max spline, uh, unit tests we shouldn't need. That's for testing that these work. Um, so the rest of them we already have added in. So some of the basic ones we can do are things like, um, I think one of hers, let me double check which ones are hers. Yeah, so she has extrude individual and um, tube converter. And those are two of the most powerful ones that she's written that are allow things to be super, super fast. So if we make a quick sketch, and we draw some rectangles. So this is like how we did, or how I did the, um, when we were making versions of like the cart, we can just draw some rectangles real quick and you see how like all their ends add up the way they're supposed to. Um, we can dimension, um, where's the, why am I blanking where dimension hole? I'm so used to hitting D. Um, oh, there it is. Okay, so yeah, so D on the keyboard, we can hit that. Tell it to be a one inch, and then we can go through and select the like side faces of all of these, do the same thing, and tell them to all be equal to each other. So that forces all those to become an inch, and then you can set like your dimensions for the whole um, the whole part. So I think the cart was something like 36 by 24 or something like that, and so all of that can be driven really quickly into this just one um, this one sketch 
And now we can go into our feature scripts, which are over here. Um, and like this is the full list of everything we have added, which is more than just Julia's, but you can go through and find them. So you can either look through this whole list, but a lot of times they're, it's annoying to like try to find it because they're not in any reasonable order sometimes. Um, so most of the time I'll just know roughly what the name is and you can just type it in this box up here. So you just click up into here um, and I want extrude individual. So if you type talking extrude and then you can click on individual. And now it just asks for whichever sketch regions you want. So I want each of these four things to be extruded. I want them to be extruded in one inch. So it already had that. And now when you extrude them, they're all their own part. Where if I just did it in the normal extrude, they would have become one thing. And been just, it would have just said part one there. And that wouldn't have worked for me because I want them all to be like individual tubes. So that saves you some time anyway because that's a, you know, a few extra clicks. Otherwise, you'd have to do like extrude that one, do it again, do it again, do it again. And it would have just taken a little while. Uh, where extrude individual just does it all for you. But then that's cool, but that's not really the really cool thing. The really cool thing is when you get into tube converter and now we can um, select all four of these. So we have all four of those parts, all four of those parts, there we go. So we have all four of those parts and it goes through and it converts them into tubes. So it was actually already selected on here because I was doing max tube earlier. So it's already selected as like the rev ion max tube, but you can tell it to be different things. You can tell it to be one inch between holes. So now it's just normal. Um, it should go to normal square tube like we would do on the router. You can tell it how like thick the tube is. So maybe this is 16th wall. And so we can get um, the tubes made however we need for whatever we're doing without having to sit there and like cat all those hole patterns or do anything else. So that's one of the things that we do very quickly, and we're going to use a lot of max tube on the robot. So being able to just draw a one by one, however long you want it, and quickly make it into max tube is super useful. It also changes the name, so you know how long they are, um, which is kind of annoying. A couple things because like when you start renaming stuff, it gets weird. So if I wanted to rename this like front rail or something. Um, it works and I can rename it, but then if I go back and I edit the tube converter, it gets a little weird later sometimes. Maybe she, she might have fixed it now. Um, let's see if it still does it. Well, it actually stayed that way this time. Okay, so maybe it works now. So at one point, like renaming got a little weird and it would like go back and change the name, but it seems like it's working now, so that's cool. Um, so you should be able to rename the parts and keep them there, which is awesome. I think that actually got fixed a while ago. I just forgot about it. Um, so those are two of the ones that are like the most useful to know how to do because if you can do those you can at least make the tubes really really fast and you're not trying to like hand do that which would take forever um yeah extrude individual and tube converter the other ones that get pretty cool are things like shafts so you can um create shafts across span so if we had um if we wanted, we could draw plates, but we can actually do it across any two holes. So like there's already holes in these tubes. So we should be able to just make the shaft generator and tell it we want a half inch hex shaft starting from like this hole. Uh, and you can tell it however you want it to be made. So you can say like up to face. So I can tell it I want it to start at that hole and go up to here. And it'll just make a half inch hex shaft crossing that hole. Um, you can tell it to be different size hex shafts, under hex, the rev rounded hex. Um, so you can create stuff without having to like sketch any of it. If it's a, some common shaft thing that we use, basically the different types of hex shafts, churro, we use them on occasion. We don't use them all the time. Um, so this isn't as convenient for us as it is for some other teams who do all of their stuff in half inch hex. Um, but if when you need it, it's a little bit easier than having to like draw the hex sometimes and like laying it all out. But you do get a part very quickly. Um, it gets a little more interesting because you can do more stuff. So you can add um, bolts and uh, bolts and washers, retaining rings. You can add all sorts of stuff to it. Um, and so, like, it'll tap or it'll add the. Um, let's see how to do it. So it'll yes, yeah, so you can add snap rings and things to it. Tubes actually generate. 
Oh, uh, so it, it did it weird. It's not in the plate. Let me hide some things real fast so you can see what the shaft looks like. There it goes. So then it adds the like snap ring groove where it's fully rounded. Um, so it does like all of that for you in just there. Most of the time we don't we're not making shafts this way very often, um, but we could. And so this has it like it's offset somewhere in that distance. You could like make it shorter. Um, whatever we wanted to do, you could have it be an E clip instead of a um, instead of a snap ring, so it like doesn't do the other end. There's a lot of different things you can do. You can chamfer ends. Um, I don't think you can chamfer when you do shaft collar, which is kind of annoying. Um, but there's definitely a few different things you can do, which is pretty helpful. Um, yeah, you can, it'll turn round bearings on automatically. So you can turn it for a um, round bearing. So if you're going to stick this in a round bearing instead of a hex bearing, it can do some things like that. Um, for you and that's just a lot faster than having to hand sketch and hand cad and had extrude hand extrude all of that stuff um, so when you do need to make different hex parts this is definitely the easiest and fastest way to do it is with the shaft generator and most time you can get something close and then if you need to we could still go in and modify this maybe we needed to like make the hole bigger on this end for some reason we could do that still just as you would any other part um, we can make this a 3 8 hole, and we could go in and extrude that back a little bit if we needed to, um, some distance. Whatever we were trying to do to make this part, we could do that. So a lot of times, a lot of times the feature scripts don't get you all the way to your finished part, but they speed up a lot of the process to get you somewhere close. Um, and then you just add a few more sketches or whatever you need to do and extrudes to get to the final part that you actually need. Um, okay, so what are some of our other ones? So similarly, they have like spacers and things, which is great. Um, a lot of times they work well. Sometimes it's a little weird with the spacer one, but it's not too bad. But especially if you're trying to make like hex spacers, you can very quickly um, tell them where you want the spacer to be. Um, it's weird here because the external diameter is too small. Um, what does this end up being? It's like 0.75. So now if you tell it to start there, you can tell it you want a inside half inch hex. It can be so long, whatever it is, and it can draw all of it for you. Um, it doesn't have to be, it can be like up to face, so it can tell it you want the spacer to go from there to there. So a lot of times that's going to let you make stuff that doesn't, um, that doesn't get messed up if you start changing dimensions. So as long as we're, if we're not typing the dimension anywhere, all of that can get, um, actually let me make this the other way. So I make it up to face to go like all the way, oh, oops, I did it the wrong way. Um, let's try this again. End face there, origin, still here. So it's like this really long thing. We probably wouldn't do this. Um, for any real reason, but if we wanted to, we could. So now this whole tube is just a big long hex spacer that covers the whole thing, um, but it, we didn't define its length, right? So it's just based on everything defined earlier, and all we've really defined for length is this one sketch. So the real cool thing about feature scripts is if you do it right, you can go back and edit the sketch and be like, oh, we don't want this to be 24 inches long anymore. We, actually, the cart needed to be 26 inches long. I can edit the sketch in this one place and everything else afterwards updates and propagates and does what we want because all of it's done on the intent that it's supposed to reach across, right? That shaft was going from here to here, so it still does it. Now it's a little bit longer. Now the spacer's longer. All the tubes get updated. Um, the name did stay the same still through all of that. Like everything can stay the same if you lay it all out correctly where you're doing things up to face and not just inputting the numbers all the time everything will just still get fixed if you go ahead and change something back earlier. Um, so it can be really, really powerful to use feature scripts and just designing based on the actual intent that you want, not just by putting in the number that happens to work at that moment. Um, not going to go too much into Gusset Generator. Um, I'm trying to think if there's more of hers that are important to look through. Um, belt and chain are useful. You can pretty quickly get the right... Um, 
belt and chain distance. Um, I think we should be able to do a chain really fast if I do a um, half inch space something. So if I do a chain generator, you can tell it what the two teeth count are. Um, and you can tell it what the pitch is. So if we know the type of chain we're using and the type of sprockets we have, um, you can tell it its center distance. You can also do in place. So if we happen to know it's 12 inch center distance, it'll make that chain force right here. And then we can go and insert it um, in the assembly however we want. You can also do them in place. So I can say I want to chain from that dot over to this dot. And it'll make the chain that crosses there. Um, so this works with chain. It works. There's a belt generator that does something very similar. Um, so then we can have that chain or belt modeled quickly without having to like figure out exactly how we want to do it. You can also make the non-simplified version, so you can make it realistic. Um, and now it's going to take a little bit while to load, but it's going to actually look like chain a little bit more. So now you can see through it in a little bit. Um, so again, you don't have to sit there and try to CAD this because it would take forever. But because we have the generator, it's super fast. Um, what are some of the other ones that she does? Um, belts is basically the same as chain. We did that one as ready. Um, I don't remember if Phillips' thing is a different one. Drive in place we don't use very often anymore. Um, but yeah, looking through and just kind of testing out some of them, if they do different things, are cool. Um, the teardrop one is brand new, so I haven't even actually seen what it is. So the keyhole. Yeah, so the keyhole one, if I remember correctly, I think this makes it so you can 3D print certain things. Um, so if we tell it it's going to be printed from that side, yeah, so it basically it flattens the top of this hole, um, which is very useful because it lets you, when you print, it can print like a straight line. So it makes the circle come out better because sometimes you end up getting like this droopy top of a circle when you 3D print. Um, so if we're making a special 3D printed part um, and you want to make it come out even nicer, you can go through and keyhole all the parts, especially if you have like a big hole that you're trying to print through um, or something you're not going to modify later. That's a lot simpler than trying to like CAD this exactly right and make that correct. Um, OK, um, let's make a new part studio because we're going to make a couple more feature scripts that aren't on Julia's list. So a couple of the other ones, I think most people have seen laser joint and T-slot, but we can go through them really quickly because they are one of the things that we use pretty regularly, pretty much all the time. Um, anytime we need to make something that connecting two flat parts together. Um, we normally do it with um, these laser joint connections. So they end up on the robot a lot. Um, when you do it, it's a little bit weird because you have to draw things that end up on top of each other. Um, so we're actually going to extrude this out the other way. And again, I'm just doing this really fast without dimensioning everything. It, ideally, we'd go through and make sure everything's the right dimension, exactly the size we need and everything. But for the example, we don't have to do that. Uh, so we're going to actually extrude this. And we're going to make it a new part, but we're going to make it go through the old part. Right. So now these are on top of each other here, which is a little bit weird. Um, but now we can use laser joint to tell it that we want to make our tab part this one and our base part this one. And it's going to go through and it's going to make all of the little like um, fingers for us, which is very helpful. There's a bunch of different options in here that you can go through. Some of them that we use a lot, some of them that we don't use as much. Um, one of the ones we almost always do is edge offset so that the, um, the fingers aren't ever like the actual outside because it's not very strong. So you always want the fingers to be fully encased on the inside. Um, I'm going to make that a little bit smaller to make it what I want. Um, OK, so something like that. So now we have these. This part has these three fingers in it. This part has these three holes in it. Um, you can set exact widths for things if you want. So sometimes that's helpful if you want these to be an exact width. 
uh, and go through. There's a bunch of different things you can do in parts of the different options. Um, for the laser, it works fine to have these like true corners where you have these true 90 degree corners. If we wanted to make the same part, but we were going to make it on the router where we have an actual like circular cutting bit, so it can't cut a true corner because it has like, a radius, um, they have this corner overcut button. So we can tell it that we're cutting with a um, 16th or an eighth inch bit, so it would be like a 16th of an inch, and it goes in and it overcuts all these corners, so it can actually make that cut now. Um, you can tell if it's bigger, maybe it's two millimeter, something like that, it makes it a little bit bigger. But so it goes through and it just does all of that for you on each one of those. So again, you're not doing it all yourself. Um, while we're thinking about corner overcut, you can actually, um, if you didn't have it built in, we can go in and I can hide this. And that's a different feature script that exists. Oops, I clicked on too much stuff. Um, is corner overcut or dog bone. Um, so corner overcut feature script lets us do that same thing, but only on like a certain hole. Let me get rid of some planes. Okay. So we can do a single one. You can also dog bone, which puts it out a different way. So it makes it, um, it cuts it into just the side instead of the other thing. The reason it's called a dog bone is because it makes it look like a dog bone once it does it. Um, oh, maybe if it'll actually let it do it all. I don't want to do it. Hmm, that's weird. Oh, um, that didn't work. Okay, there we go. Now it'll do it. Yeah, so now it looks like a dog bone, which is why it called a dog bone. You could go through and manually choose any holes you want to do that. So if we're going to cut something on the router, a lot of times we'll need to do that if we're trying to make a square face here and we don't want that like radius that's going to get cut if we did it on the actual router. Um, overcut works the same way. Um, so both of those, again, are useful most of the time when you're cutting with an actual rotary cutting bit on the CNC router and not on the laser. Um, oh, yeah, so then the last part of this is once we have the fingers, we have to actually do the um, T-slot um, connection, so the T-slot joint. And this definitely takes a little bit of getting used to to make sure you have all the settings right. Um, and the spot you click to do it is a little bit weird. You have to click the edge faces below where you want the hole to be. So if we want a hole here to be able to bolt through and have like the T-slot the where we put the little nut and everything, we have to click the face that's hidden. So you have to hide this part and put the and select these faces in here. And then it does what we want. It actually makes the joint. And when you unhide these, the hole's there and everything. So that's how you actually use that to make the joint that we need. Um, again, all these in that document, they have the link to, so you can add them to your on shape. There's also some videos on how to actually use them. Um, there's a bunch of little settings in here. So you can like, a lot of times we end up having to test it for whatever material we're using to get the exact fit we want for the nut and for the depth and for everything else. Um, Cause if you don't get the thickness of the material right, none of this actually matches up to reality. So I drew it all as quarter, but almost never, our, our wood is almost never actually quarter. Our polycarbonate's not actually quarter. So a lot of times you have to go in and make it the correct dimension, like measure the material you're using with calipers, put in the correct dimension. Um, you can change the nut sometimes, depending on if it's wood or plastic, you may want it to be a little bit tighter so it holds the nut better um, or looser, depending on how long you want it, depending on what the nut is. Like all of those things can be changed in these settings. But again, it's way simpler just to modify them in this menu instead of having to go through and CAD sketch each one of these like we used to have to do when we were doing it in SOLIDWORKS. Um, OK. So what else ones do we look at? So auto layout. Auto layout is cool. It's a little bit weird. It doesn't work as well as I would like sometimes. I was trying to use it for the rubber band car, actually. Um, and it wasn't giving the results I wanted. Um, it is helpful, so on occasion it's nice. So basically if you have these parts and you want, um, instead of, if you want them all to be in like one single DXF, instead of having to export each one of them to put on the laser cutter, you can just click on auto layout real fast. You can tell it you want the parts to be the 0.25 material, and you can tell it how big of a sheet you're going to cut into. So 10 by 10 or so. And now it'll automatically like flip the parts up to be together. You can tell that what like type of spacing you want. 
and it'll move them around so that you have the parts all flat together, and so you could make like a single, um, well, you should be able to make a DXF of this somehow. I don't remember how to do it. I have to go back and look. But there's a way to make this into a DXF um, of all of the parts. Um, so you could laser just this whole thing, which is convenient. Um, most of the time, it's fine just to do it on your own. If you have a bunch of things and you want to like lay them out specifically or try to get them to fit in a certain area, Auto Layout does a decent job of it. It doesn't always find the right way to orient things to be able to use the smallest amount of space. But sometimes it's helpful. Um, what other ones do we have? We talked about that one already. Um, there's a bunch of other ones that you can go through and like look at different people's. There's like a whole GitHub on just different feature scripts that people have. Um, a bunch of them from 3D stuff, things that we don't do very often. But like a lot of people have written different feature scripts that all work. Um, what are some other cool ones? Um, yeah, so like surface text and advanced gear are cool. So surface text, they're very different, but we can look at them anyway. So surface text, um, if you're 3D printing something and you want to be able to print text into it, um, I think this should work. Let's see if I can make this work. So I can tell it that's the line. Oop, maybe that didn't work. Uh, okay, so if I tell it that's the line and that's the surface, there we go. So then you can tell it to have a certain amount of um, you can tell it to print actual like text on here. So if we were going to like 3D print, it could have the lettering on there. Um, so you could type whatever you wanted. You can choose whatever font you want or whatever, and then you can actually have that show up on your printed part. Um, it does work um, sometimes with cutouts. So if you also wanted to just put text and have it cut out for something that we're going to laser, um, you could do that if you're going to cut all the way through. You'd want to make sure the letters were big enough so we could actually see it when you did it fully on the letter on the on the laser cutter. Um, you can change sometimes the actual like font and things. So you can set the the text height. You can tell it to be, oops, yeah, things break sometimes. Um, they don't always work. Yeah, so you got to play with it. Sometimes there's weird things that don't quite work when you do it this way. Um, but you get the idea. So you can eventually have actual text on parts really quickly, which is very convenient. Um, so if we wanted to have things labeled, so we, like literally every time we print a pulley or something, we could go in and tell it the number of teeth on that pulley so we're not sitting there counting them every time. But you would need to update it so you're not printing a pulley that has the incorrect number of teeth with the wrong text on it. Um, that would be very frustrating. Um, some of the other ones are things like advanced gear. So the, the gears we used on our launcher, um, you can just create gears with this feature script so you don't have to like sit there and like CAD every single gear tooth. Um, you can tell it the different types. So like this is how we made those herringbone gears. We went in and found settings we liked um, based on whatever we were doing. I don't remember exactly what we even did with them exactly um, to make them work, but I know we did some settings that we eventually found that worked well for the printed gears that we were using. But so if we need to do something like that again, we can very easily print um, gears however we need to. And then you can go in and sketch all the bores. You can add, we like add it to a pulley or whatever we need to do to it. But it gives you all of the faces and stuff generated very quickly. So you're not having to go in and, again, manually do any of that. Um, same if we wanted a different type of gear, we could go in and sketch that if we want to spur helical gear, which are different shapes. Um, we could get one of those pretty easily as well. Um, but again, most of the time we're probably, most time if we're printing, we're probably trying to print herringbone gears. They're stronger for most things. Um, there might be a time where we want to do something else. Uh, okay, what other ones exist? Surface X advanced gear. 
the flange stuff, we'll talk about thin extrude and the flange stuff some other time oh, if we ever need to get into sheet metal. Um, um, variable library, most of those we don't care about too much. Um, yes, yeah, so I think those are most of the ones we end up using a decent amount. Let me look through and see if there's ones that I didn't cover. Um, there's definitely some odder ones that we use on occasion. Oh, fill it all edges is cool. Um, so on occasion, if we need to fill it, you end up having to like sit there and select every corner, which is kind of frustrating. Um, if you just click the fill it all edges one, uh, which I now forgot where it is. Let me type it. Um, we can click fill it all edges. It takes a face and it literally fillets all the edges of that face. Um, except it doesn't do it if everything is too small. Let me make that even smaller. Nope, it doesn't. Oh, because I think it has the lettering on it. Let me do a part that doesn't have the lettering on it. Um, let's see if that works. This is definitely a weirder part to do it on. Um, rectangle and see if that works. Did I break fill it all edges for some reason? It used to work. Oh, there it goes. Okay, so yeah, so it's, as long as it's a simple shape, I think some of the, uh, I think the shapes in here weren't letting it fill it because they were so tiny. Um, but yeah, so this lets you do most shapes pretty easily. Most of the shapes that we're using, if we're just making something to go on the laser that doesn't have any of the uh, really small cutouts in it or anything. You then can just fill it all of them. And so it's a, it saves you a few clicks to do it this way. Um, it also is nice because it'll update nicely. So if I go and I edit this sketch, and now if I you know, change the way this works, um, what do I want? I want the trim tool. So I'm gonna cut through those and leave. Now I have a different shape. All of those edges are still filleted because it's just filleting all of them, instead of if I had done it the other way, I would have had to go back in and add each of those fillets again. So again, a lot of times things like that are just helpful to make you have to do less work if you have to rework something later on, you add an edge, it'll just go through and automatically do it for you. Which can be good, but also can be a little scary if you don't know exactly how you have it set up. It might end up um, filleting something you didn't want it to, um, things like that. So it might make, cause some mistakes, but it also might save you some hassle for getting to fill it, which is worse most of the time, um, as we end up with a really sharp edge on the robot somewhere that we don't want. Um, I think that's most of the ones we actually use regularly. There's some other like 3D printing ones, so bridge layer helps with 3D printing. Um, but again, there's pretty specific use cases for those types of things. Um, most of the time we're not using those. Uh, there's some motor mounting ones that give you the um, specific, um, oh, let me put a hole in something so we can make that work. Um, okay, so I don't use this one too often, but it is useful if you don't have, if, depending on what we're trying to mount. If we want to mount a sim-like motor to this hole, how do you do that? Oh, do you have to do it on a point? You might have to do it on a point, actually. Um, let me go to that. Let me see if this works. I think you can do it on a sketch point. And we'll just go through there. Yeah, that works, okay. So yeah, so you have to do it on a vertex, so like that point of that hole. And so then it tells you, um, it gives you the motor mounting for a sim-like motor, which is also a Falcon or a Neo, um, or any of those. Um, and you can tell it the different, you can put it at a different angle if you want, um, whatever you need to. So if you don't know the dimensions of how the motor mounting works, you can very quickly just get a motor mounting, um, a workable motor mount, 
rather quickly into this. You can do two, four, six for like Falcon. Um, that got weird because it's like cut off. But you can very easily get Falcon mounting, mounting holes without having to know what any of the dimensions are or how any of those work. Um, this also works for all the other motors. We don't really use the other motors very often, but if we did, they're all here. Um, the convenient thing about the Falcons and Neos and Sims is they're relatively easy to remember. So this hole is 0.75 is the pilot hole. These holes are 0.21, whatever, 0.196. They're a clearance hole for a number 10, um, and they're two inches apart. So it's rather easy to remember those are. So a lot of times I just sketch them from memory. But if you don't remember what they are, doing it this way is totally fine. Looking them up is also fine. Um, it is convenient that it exists. Um, it also is convenient that if you did it this way, you could edit it really fast to get, if you wanted to switch from a Falcon to a Neo, you could get that done really quickly. Um, Cause they just have different number of holes, but they're all in that same pattern. They're all two inches apart. They're just clocked slightly differently. Um, okay, I think that's most of the ones we use. Oh, there is one that's kind of cool that we didn't look at. So gusset is cool. So if we're custom making our own gussets, most of the time we're just gonna use ones that exist but sometimes you just need to cut, connect a bracket or connect some tubes in a different way. So the gusset feature script lets us do that really fast. So if we just select a variety of holes, it creates the gusset for us that would connect all those holes. Um, Yeah, and then you can do something where you can like select the lines, I think. I think you have to like draw the lines. I don't remember exactly how this works. Um, this get a little bit weirder. But yeah, so either way, it makes the gusset the way kind of worth roughly what we want. Um, you can tell it it's like offset height, so you can tell it how much to cover. And so you can make different styles of gussets very quickly, um, depending on how you wanted to make things. It would change stuff a little bit. So you can go through and make the part. It actually sets the material apart for you um, and all of that. So now you have a part that would we could easily laser cut and get that gusset on top of there really fast without having to draw it. Drawing it's not too difficult, but sometimes this works well, um, especially, again, if things are going to change or move around. This would somewhat help with that. Um, this might be a little odd because it's like missing the hole here in, to, in the pattern. But also, for this specific case, that hole clearly doesn't do anything. It would be on the edge. But it might be something we'd want um, if we we're going to keep this for some other reason. Um, OK, I think that's most of the ones we actually use. I should probably go through and remove some of these other ones that we don't actually use very often. Um, does anyone have any questions or anything that they're like, oh, that was cool. Can you go over it again? Or anything you want to talk about? You can type it into meeting chat or talk about it, whatever works for you. Or is there anything that we've done on robots that you want to see how we do? Uh, yeah, I can show motor mount again. Um, okay, so backing up, I need to delete that. Uh, okay, so motor mount just takes a single vertex. So most of the time, let me make this something smaller so it makes more sense. Okay, so most of the time we'd have some plate, and we were gonna go in, and we wanted to tell the motor to be some correct distance from everything. Um, do something like that. Um, actually, let me make it a little bit, that's eh, fine. Um, so we want the motor to be here. Um, we can use the motor mount, uh, motor mounting feature script to tell it where it's gonna be. So we have it at that, it ought to select, it already had that point selected, so that's where it's gonna be, is right here. It's gonna be the center. Merge scope is basically what part do we want it to like, do whatever it's gonna act on. So in this case, it's gonna act on by like removing stuff, it's gonna make holes. So we're gonna tell it the merge scope is this part. And so depending on what we want, what type of motor we want, it'll make whatever the holes we want for that motor. 
Um, so any of those motors could work. Um, it'll do all of them. But most of the time for us, we're just going to do sim-like and do Falcon, which is six. Um, then you can also tell it like different um, rotations that you want it to be in. Oh, it does not like zero. Okay. Um, you could have a certain angle reference if you wanted to to change the way it was like rotated or whatever you wanted it to do. Um, if this part was bigger, it wouldn't cut through like that. Um, but that's very convenient if you don't have the motor dimensions already. If you don't just want to do them in your initial sketch, adding them in this way works well uh, most of the time. Uh, most of the time for us, because we're only using a single motor, it's less difficult. If we were using the 550s or the 775s, I, I never remember the mounting for those. I would almost certainly use this a lot. The Falcons and the Sims and the Neos are all pretty easy because it's 0.75 here and then two inch spacing across the holes um, and then evenly spaced circles, either two, four, six. Other questions, other things we'd like to go over? Anything I went over too fast that you want to see again? Um, I don't think I missed too many of those. Um, the other stuff that's in this document, this document is just useful to go through anyway. There's a couple like apps and things that we've used on occasion. We don't really use them very much anymore. But like link tab lets you put like other random tabs into a um, into a document, um, which is cool. So you can um, you can have like a Google Sheet or something in the document that you can just always reference. Um, the other ones we don't use pretty much ever. I probably should just remove them from there. Um, we also have useful things like going over the keyboard shortcuts. Um, some other things to think about as you're just going through and doing your Catting, especially on the robot, uh, making sure that we have stuff updated. There's some workflow stuff um, that's kind of helpful. We don't always, well, some of these have changed. I probably need to go through and reread some of these and see how we've done them. Um, but most of the time we can do, there's some things that we've just, anytime that I've had to do something a little bit odd, I've tried to write it down so we don't have to, that we remember how to do it in the future. Um, I don't think measure distance matters anymore. It used to be annoying to do it otherwise, but now it just kind of auto does it. Um, a lot of the times, like feature scripts will exist before Onshape proper will like write a tool to do a certain thing or like write a feature into the program. So then eventually the feature scripts don't have to exist anymore when Onshape comes out with a new feature. I think measure distance is one of those times. Now the distance stuff is all better inside of Onshape. Um, Um, some of the stuff, some of the other ones you can go through on Onshape 4 FRC, they have blog posts on how to use certain things. Uh, most of the time we don't use Lighten very often, but like we've seen teams have like the very fancy Lightened gearboxes. You can go through and see how to use the Lighten feature script to do that. Um, create some of like the webbing and stuff. Um, similarly, um, I think there's a way, what's the other one you can do? You can do like ISO grid on things. So if I draw a two by one, it's like a really long two by one and we wanna make sure it's able to get lightened. I think I can, what would I wanna do? So I can make that part. I could like tube convert it to be What are we gonna do? We're gonna make it not max tube. We're just gonna make it like versa frame. So it just has holes across the top, um, but it doesn't have anything on the sides. And then if I use, I think Julia has an ISO grid pattern um, thing, so we can take regions of patterns. So we can throw on here. We're gonna pattern this. The lightened bodies is also gonna be that part. 
and I think it's going to do what we want. I vaguely remember that this works. Yeah, so now we have like a super lightened um, hole. There's probably too many holes or the size is not quite right. Uh, there's probably a way to make that a little bit smaller or change the way we need to do this with offsets and things. There's almost certainly a way to make that not drill through the actual top surface of the tube everywhere. Um, but you get roughly the idea of how this would work. Um, if that's what we want. Oh, that doesn't need to be in there. Oh, maybe it does. That got real weird. Uh, <laughs> interesting. Yeah, I'm not sure exactly what that's supposed to do, but somehow you can make it to where it actually do what we want correctly without putting the holes there so it would shrink onto the pattern. You may have to like change the um, region pattern. Oh, that actually does do it. So yeah, so if we make this a little bit smaller, it would work the way we'd want. Oh, it might be that the hole diameters get off. Oh yeah, that's basically what we want. It just did it over on this side. So yeah, so that's pretty close to what you'd want if you wanted to have the full ISO grid with the holes and everything. Um, this would work if you tell it to not have holes. I think that's what changes it to where it works a little bit easier now that I realize what I was doing. Yeah, so now it doesn't have holes at all. So if we put that back to one inch, you get like the fully lightened ISO grid. So we could, in theory, go through and cut this all on the router if we really wanted to make a really light 2 by one for some reason. We could do this. Um, and instead, what you, what you used to have to do if you wanted to do this was have to go through and like CAD each of these and like pattern it, and it would take forever. Um, but with something like the ISO grid setup, um, the feature script, you don't have to do that, and it does it all for you. Um, so this is how um, you can get some of that stuff really, really fast without having to spend hours in sketches and patterning and doing it all yourself. Okay, um, other questions? Things you want me to s demo or show or answer? We can see where some of them get used in last year's robots. I'm pretty sure they're decent number in intake. Intake had a lot of parts. Um, yeah, so in like intake plates, if you look through the feature tree once it eventually loads, we should see like the. Um, Several places where we used the laser joints and T-slot joints. So like all of those were done that way. Um, this belt should have been done that way too. Yep, so this was, if we edit this, this was the belt generator. So it generated the belt in place. Um, I think that was the main ones we used here. Those are some of the ones that we used the most. Um, I think there's too many others. There's probably a belt here. That was done that same way. Yep, so belt generator does that. Um, I don't think most of the others used any. Um, these were probably just done with pulleys and derived parts. Yeah, so those don't really change much of what we're doing. Um, let's see. That's most of those are like I said a lot of those same ones that get used over and over again um, most of the time so things like drive crane should have used tube converter I believe and I'm almost certain we used it a decent amount inside of climber oh, and some random empty parts of you as we should get rid of that's a different problem um, yeah a lot of times we need to clean up some things and get 
stuff put into folders like they probably should be. Um, so this is definitely supposed to be farther to the left in our organization system, but as the year goes on, it's harder to remember to keep everything organized as much as it should. Um, but if we do it better, it does save us some headache later. All right, let's see. So yeah, so things like all of these tubes in here, almost certainly, yeah. So there's an extrude and then a tube converter to get these into regular tubes. Um, I don't think we did, so like this is a motor mount, but it doesn't have like all of the holes. It only has certain ones. So these were all done just in a sketch, but we could have done them with the motor mount um, feature script if we wanted to. But a lot of times when you have like multiple or something, it, it ends up being easier to go in and actually sketch the holes and just like do the circular patterns and stuff. Like it takes a little bit more time, but you have a little bit more control over it and exactly lining everything up the way we want. Um, just doing it manually in a sketch sometimes is better, but especially if you're just doing quick things, if you're doing any sort of prototype, using the feature scripts to help you get through that and get through it faster is almost always better for things that we're just going to try to get through really, really quickly. Um, yeah, so all of the tubes in here, yep, so each one of these is all done in one big tube converter from almost all of that. So we basically um, extruded individual, then extruded a couple other things, and then all five of those were all done as tube converter. And then we just went in and added the cutouts for some of the holes that we had for like wires and things. Um, I don't think most of the others use too many feature scripts. Most of the other stuff is just sketching and extruding. Most of the same things that we do making most of the parts on the robot. Yep, uh, I don't think anything else is that different. Okay, um, any other questions? I think that's all we really have for today. Okay, I'm happy to stick around and answer anything. If not, 